welcome you to this lunchtime talk, which I've been looking forward to for months. Um, I have to tell you boring things first. Mobile phones off, I think, or, or silent. It's fine, we're not in a plane. Um, and we're filming and live streaming, so if you're not supposed to be here, wear a hat. Um, welcome to everybody tuning in online. And remember that the hashtag is hashtag RSA1%, spelt out, okay, if you want to get involved in Twitter. Wow, that's atmospheric. So we have a rave afterwards. Um, now, housekeeping over. It's my great pleasure to introduce this afternoon's special guest speaker. Danny Dorling is the Halford Mackinder. I don't know how to spell that. I mean, pronounce that. Professor at Oxford. Um, he's so prolific that a colleague of mine went, went to interview him once and made the mistake of printing out his CV, and it was 83 pages long. <laughs> <laughs> and she was quite young, so everybody was shouting at her. Dawn, get off the printer! Um, I mean, he, he, he really is a colossus in the world of equality. I know we're not supposed to say that about equality, but it's true. Um, and his new book, coming so hot on the heels of All That Is Solid, a wonderful book about housing, is Can We Afford the Super Rich? I can, I can ru ruin the punchline and say, no, we can't. But um, let's let him tell us why not. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much for inviting me. I'm going to force Zoe later on to explain that um, she was partly late because it involved Russell Brand and the police in Newham this morning, uh, which is probably a more exciting story than the story I'm, I'm going to tell, tell you. Uh, the, one, the one really good thing about studying inequality is it stops you feeling bad about your own position at all in society. It, you know, it can actually make you feel fairly happy because you realise where you are and what's happening, uh, and then it becomes as a surprise to you just how few people realise what the income and wealth distribution is in this country, what it's normal to have, what you have to have to fall into various groups. So I'm going to explain a bit of that uh, to you, and I make no apology because I've just spent two days in London, and for a large amount of the last two days, I've been talking to people about, about this book, about inequality and the 1%, telling them where the thresholds are, and then often the instant reaction from the kind of people I've been meeting is, oh no, that's not enough to get you in the 1%. Surely you need more than that to be rich um, because of the kind of people you get to, to meet and who has power, who's involved in publishing in the media, and so on. There is a perception that more people have more and it's normal to have a lot. And if we can do anything it would be useful to begin to alter that perception. I only have one slide, so you have plenty of time uh, <laughs> to, get, to get used to this slide. Um, this is the group right at the very top. There is more inequality within the 1%, the best of 1% in Britain, than there is within the other 99%. And, and that, I think, is quite important. Uh, what you're seeing here is a map of the country where area has been sized to make each region proportional to the wealth of the super rich, the 1,000 richest families that the Sunday Times very kindly documents each year and then tells us in glorious detail about, including write-ups about how wonderful some of them are. Um, so I buy, I buy the Sunday Times meticulously once a year uh, <laughs> to get this. Uh, what I've also done is to highlight the 24 richest families in the country. Uh, there is one in each region, including one in the Char Channel Islands, uh, and there are 10 in London. And in London, those little circles have them sized by the size of their wealth. And what you can see immediately, the bulk of the super rich in this country live in London, but for all of them living in London the richest 10 families are taking a third of all the wealth. So it's not that hard if you're in a member of the super rich not to feel that you're taking an enormous amount because you can look up at those, at those 10 families and say, well, my millions are fairly modest compared to the millions above me. I couldn't possibly afford to buy a house on Bishop's Avenue or, or wherever. And this may sound a bit flippant, but this is the kind of story you get all the way down throughout the 1% and a little bit beneath. I'm not that well off. The people above me are much better off. I have enough just to be able to get by. 
It is hard to be able to buy a house and so on. Um, I have expenses. I have to pay for schools and, and, and the like. Why are you wanting me to have less? As a country becomes more unequal, as the divisions widen and as it steepens up amongst the very top, the cost of being in the very top rises. It does actually become much harder to get into the 1% and harder to hold yourself in there. I didn't pick the 1% simply because the Occupy movement picked uh, the 1%. Well, they, they were remarkably apposite. If the book was properly titled, it would probably be something like Inequality in the 1.27%, but that, uh, I don't think Leo, my publisher, would have allowed that. Um, to last year, I published an article in the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society looking at income changes amongst different groups in society, the 0.01, the 0.1, the 1%, the 10%, and so on. And the very interesting thing that has happened since 2008 is that a new cleavage has emerged between the 1% and those beneath them. The incomes, and certainly the wealth, but the incomes of the 1%, including people at the bottom of the 1%, have been rising since 2008. There was a small blip, but then it came up. In spring this year, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, who are remarkably good at this, HMRC released figures in spring showing that the 1% had had their biggest ever, I think, uh, increase in, in income. They're remarkably good because they, they published these figures just before the end of the tax year, so I'm not quite sure how they know, but HMRC actually now estimate people's incomes and send tax demands to, based on what they think you're going to earn, so they're quick. The 1% have been getting richer and richer more quickly very recently, and you'll know that average standards of living and average wages have gone down since 2008, particularly at the bottom, and benefit changes mean that people at the bottom are going to sink down even further. The Institute of Fiscal Studies published a report last year showing that for 99% of us, income inequality since the Great Crash has reduced so that the Gini coefficient of inequality is now back to what it was in 1990. So we are more in it together, except for the 1%. And it's, it's no good being all in it together if you do have 1% moving off. At this point, you're probably wondering, am I in the 1%? What is the 1%? What's the, what's the qualifying level uh, to be in the 1%? I won't... It'll be, lo it'll be lovely if we had kind of little calculators linked to the screen and you could all type in a figure and we could actually see what the, <laughs> what the range was. Um, for the book, I wanted to produce one of those kind of height-weight charts. Do you know the ones? I know the ones far too well. You look up your height, you look at your weight, there's these curves, and you can work out whether you're overweight or obese yet. And some of, us, <laughs> some of us are on that kind of curve. I wanted to try to do that with income and wealth, because if you know somebody's income and their wealth, you can do a curve. Our, our wealth statistics are simply too poor to be able to do that. But if you've got spare surplus money, that is money you can realise, you could easily downsize from a house or so on, or you own more than one property, of about a million in your household, you're in the 1% by wealth. By income, the cut-off point to get in the 1% is a gross income before tax of 160000 for your household if there are two of you and you have no kids. So it's 160. I won't ask anybody to put their hands up, um, but there will be people here who are in the 1%. Most of you, even in this audience, and this audience, of course, is very likely to be majority 10%. Um, most of you will not be in that. So 160,000 before tax, household income, if there's two of you, no kids. Kids, you're looking at about 200, 220,000 pounds because of expenses that comes with kids. And families of kids tend to have a bit more. If you're single, you can get in the 1%. Uh, with £100,000. Uh, I talked to a journalist earlier this week for the Evening Standard about these things, and he kind of got the wrong end of the stick. And so if you read the Evening Standard a couple of days ago, 
you'll see an article about what you need to do to get into the 1%. Um, <laughs> because I was spending so long trying to explain what the thresholds were that, that he thought this book is a kind of advice book about how to get, how, how to get there. And he, he didn't kind of get the idea. And it's amazing how many people don't get the idea um, that not only can you not all get in the 1%, but in fact, never more than 1% of people can get in the 1%. Um, <laughs> No matter how much advice, how much advice we, we, we give you, it, it's, it's not possible. It's not possible to do. Um, but I did, I did think that the, the way that article was written was indicative of one of the problems of gross inequality, in that we begin to get a society which begins to try to address these problems by saying to people, well, this is what you need to try to get up there. Your only chance is to get up. Um, and we kind of dumb ourselves down in a way. The 1% are taking each year now about 15% of all income. I get 15% by adding in a little bit of estimates of tax dodging. Um, so if you look at the Paris Do Top Incomes data set, they say 14. I think it's 15%. You have to go back to the early 1930s to find the 1% taking this much um, before. It's a huge amount of money. I ought to have stacked up, you know, you can have the NHS for that every year. You can, you can add on the rest of the public uh, services you can have for that. There is nowhere else you can go in Europe to find the 1% taking as much. We are the dunce of Europe. We are the most unequal country in Europe by far. We have median household incomes in this country which are slightly lower than those in France and in Germany. But in France and, and Germany, um, they all do better because they share out far more and their 1% takes far less. If you want a nearby country that's doing very well, it's the Netherlands. The 1% in the Netherlands take just under 7% of all income. Um, a, a better example in a way, or a, a country that in some ways is more like us because they have lots of bankers, is Switzerland. And in Switzerland, the 1% are taking about half as much as our 1%. Swiss bankers get salaries which are half as much uh, as our bankers. And I don't think they do a worse job at banking in Switzerland. <laughs> um, banking really matters, increasingly matters in the 1%. The 1% used to be a more diverse set of people, uh, but many of the professions that used to just about tip into the 1%, this would be head teachers of very large schools, it would be doctors or surgeons doing very well, They've just about dropped out. There are hardly any GPs in the 1%, and there are about 200. Almost all of the GPs that are in the 1% have interests on the side. I think there are almost no head teachers that are in the 1%. It's increasingly full of financiers and managers. I think partly managers because, you know, if you're employing financiers so much, you know, you don't want to be paying people less than you're getting. And just to reiterate some statistics which are quite old but, but worth looking at. The European Commission uh, now surveys salaries in banks. Uh, we don't. You have to go to Europe to actually find out about incomes at the top. We have over 2,200 bankers in this country, which are all in, almost in this city, paid over a million euros a year. The next highest country after our 2,200 is Germany, which has a larger population. Germany has 197. Um, the rest of Europe simply does not pay people at the top this much. If you go to one bank, I don't feel bad about talking about this bank because it's the bank I joined as a student because they paid me £10 when I was 18. Um, I feel, you know, I've, I've, I've donated enough from my current account to them. But if you go to Barclays, you'll see Barclays has over 300 members of staff paid over a million. If you look at the whole of Japan, a country with twice our population, and you look across all of finance and industry in Japan, you will not find 300 people paid over a million. It's, it's remarkably different. Why do we do it? Because we're so closely connected to the USA, where these kinds of salaries in New York, New York are seen as not being unreasonable because so many of our bankers move... Well, they don't move that fast back and forward, to be honest. Um, but they do often have had a job there and a job back again.
there really is a problem of, of perception about these things because you begin to get people working in finance and, and living in London in the cities that see very high incomes as being particularly low incomes. And while you have that kind of mentality, it becomes very hard to actually argue for change, to get things to change, because people say they can't possibly manage on less. Um, if you say you want to do something sensible, such as extend the council tax system to make it a bit more progressive, you immediately have people shouting you down, saying that their two million house is a modest house and they couldn't possibly afford to pay slightly more tax on it because they say their circumstances are straightened. It's a stupid idea to call it a mansion tax. You should never have called it a mansion tax. Uh, but just extending council tax bans up, as Wales has done, should be possible. But the resistance to it comes because we've become so used to these gross inequalities. And they're altering the way we behave. They alter what we think is good, what we tell people to do. If you look at what students are now going to do in university, increasing numbers are heading towards finance and management and economic and economics and law because these are part of the very few numbers of, of professions that give you a chance of working your own way into the 1%. People are now being told to aspire to be in a very wealthy group. Not to aspire to be in the most useful 1%, uh, but to aspire to be in the best paid 1%. And it is extremely expensive and inefficient. It mucks up all kinds of things. It mucks up your education system. Uh, you end up with the most divided education system in Europe, and you end up with escalating school fees in the private sector. Average school fees are now four and a half times as paid for the average child in the private sector as opposed to the state sector. And the more the 1% get, the higher the cost that rises, and then that as to the kind of problems that people in the bottom of the 1% talk about having. Um, they become separated from the rest of, of society. But they're the kind of people that you see if you're watching TV and somebody's discussing the newspapers. And it, it's well worth, I, I, my favourite thing on the news is, is when they discuss the newspapers. Because people have to talk about the newspapers and everyday stories hiding their own personal positions. Um, Almost always the people who are pundits on this thing do not use state services, do not have the same kind of issues that the majority of society have got, but they've learnt, at least if they're in the media, how to hide the fact. But their interests and their wishes are increasingly different. When you pay your taxes, what are you paying for? The only thing you're getting are the bins being emptied. Everything else, once you're into the middle of the 1%, you're paying for yourself and you begin to resent paying for the rest. A third of all income tax is now paid by the 1% because the 1% takes so much. Uh, in a more normal country, you have a much more even distribution of income and earnings, and the 1% contribute far less to income tax because they have far less to contribute and everybody else has more, so they can all contribute more, more fairly. I'll just end up with two minutes about what you could do about it, and then, then we'll have a chat. But I want to reiterate this. Nothing is going to happen until this is seen as a problem. And it will not be seen as a serious problem until people are aware of the extent of inequality and those towards the top are aware of just how near to the top they're getting. Remember, for this 1% group as a whole, these are in the richest 1% of 1% of the world population, and still they struggle. ONS does a survey where it asks people if they're finding it hard financially. 6% of people over £100,000 say they're finding it hard financially. The group just beneath that, people on 80 or 90, it's almost zero. They know they're not finding it hard financially because they're better connected to the people beneath them. But this cleavage is opening up. So what to do? You, be you begin by saying that this has got too far, this is too big, it is not desirable, the cost of it is too great. In a country becoming poorer with, a mass with massive, massive public debt, those who should be contributing the most to that are those who have the most to contribute. The ways in which they can contribute to that are through wealth taxation. Uh, that's more equitable than income taxation, and so we should be looking at land and we should be looking at 
council tax rises, we should be looking at Kate Barker's proposal this week of capital gains tax on your property, on your primary property, just to call the you know, super elevated housing market down. I'm in favour of having higher top tax rates, um, a rate of 60%, say, at half a million, a rate of 70%, say, at a million, not to raise money, it would raise less money, not because people would hide their money, but what higher rates of tax do is discourage people in a very good bargaining position from bargaining for higher salaries because they know most of what they bargain for they will not get. Um, if you look at those countries that have kept their tax rates high, there the 1% have not asked for more. We need to see this as a serious problem. And one way of seeing it as a serious problem is to say, what happens if we don't begin to address it? What happens if the current trajectories carry on? If the best off 1% continue to sail upwards, if the group just beneath them, the 2%, the 3%, the 4%, continue to move down, which they're doing, they've lost child benefit, which is small, but they haven't seen pay rises either. What kind of society do you head towards if we carry on on our current trajectory? And there are at least two ways of, of looking at that. One way is to look across at the United States and to see what society is like in the United States, to look at people's pensions in the United States and what's happening to most people in the US. In the US, the top 1% take 20% of all income. They may be at a turning point. It may be just about to come down, but it's much higher than us. And the other way in which we can look at where we're heading at the moment is to look back in our past and to go back to Downton Abbey times and just to reverse it. And then you've got to ask yourself, which of my children will in future become a servant for a member of the 1%? Um, because that's the way you're currently heading at the moment. And I think if we begin to do that, if we begin to look forward, and also if we do look at the complaints of people in the bottom half of the 1% <coughs> about how hard they find it, and the fact that they do not appear to be particularly happy I think it's possible to, to see ways in which things could be moved forward, but it is as hard to do it now as it was the last time we turned. The last time we had a peak of inequality was 1913. And if you can imagine standing at a podium in 1913 and saying, all this has to change, it will change, and so on. Now, the First World War changed things. The revolution in Ireland changed things. The revolution in Russia changed things. Um, but above all that, it had reached an unsustainable peak at that point, and it had to change. What first changed was, was the moral sentiment of a nation. You began to see people say, this is wrong, it can't carry on like this, you have to begin to, pay, to behave differently. We're beginning to see that. The top talent budget in the BBC has been halved in the last four years. We no longer have a banker like Bob Diamond paid that much. You're just beginning to see it. But we are miles and miles away from normal European disdain for extreme greed. And I think we have to get to that point. It's not about envy. We are going to be poorer as a country overall. It's not really about redistribution, because it's a public debt that needs to be paid off. You're redistributing to the debt, not to poorer people. It's about what's fair, what's right, and what kind of country you want your children and your grandchildren to be growing up in. Thank you very much. Fighting off the urge to become depressed. <laughs> tell us about Russell Brand. OK, I'll quickly tell you about Russell Brand. It's a related story because there's, there are these women occupying um, empty council, council houses in Newham. Um, but you may, you may have heard it because The Guardian has already written about it. Um, but basically, their, their point is exactly as you just said. You know, they're being kind of, and you wrote about this in All That Is Solid, they're being cleansed out of the area. And, they still, and they, you know, people still want them to come in and service their offices but they they're being kind of sent 100 miles away um and that you know there's there isn't any way in all of newham that you could pay a normal rent on a on a normal salary so you know what what these people are supposed to do is completely anyway so they they're occupying these things and i went down to interview them and then russell brand arrived so everybody of course went completely he's the most charismatic person you've ever met everybody went mad and then because there was suddenly this activity the police arrived then they wouldn't let any of us leave. <laughs> and I was thinking, 
well, you, you can't, A, you can't arrest me, but B, you definitely can't arrest Russell Brand. <laughs> anyway, sorry, that's ir irrelevant. Um, one of the things I find difficult arguing, or I find crops up a lot in anti, or in kind of pro-inequality arguments, are, um, is, are people who think inequality is fine because it, what's the problem with it if it makes everybody richer? What, what, what do you say to that? Uh, well, it hasn't. Um, it's the most obvious, it's most obvious. I mean, that's much easier to say since 2008. Before 2008, in, in the UK, uh, people in, at the bottom did see an increase in, in uh, standard living. It was about 50% better than their parents. They saw the smallest increase, but they did get one. Um, but it wasn't necessarily because of, of what was happening at the top. In the USA, over that same period, people at the bottom didn't get richer. And the USA, of course, had the biggest increase of wealth in the 1%, and they saw no standards of living rises since the 1980s for most people. If you go to any of those countries where the 1% take less, uh, particularly Japan where they take the least, uh, you see people at the bottom saw by far the biggest increase in their standards of living. So things get better for people at the bottom in those countries where the 1% take least amongst all rich countries. And that's, it, that's just what's happened um, and what is happening. It, they don't, the 1% don't create wealth. They're not some kind of Paul Daniels figure with a, you know, a hat and a bunny, you know, doing wealth creating. They, they do not create wealth. They chase wealth. They chase investments. Their money moves around the world desperately looking for ways to carry on, on earning. Um, but it is not they that create it. And the more that people at the top have got, uh, the more people have been unemployed yeah. in, in various countries. We had our lowest rates of unemployment back in the 1950s and 60s when the 1% took less. Uh, we now have a much bigger salary bill in this country than we've ever had before. But so much more of it's going on the top 10% and in particular on the top 1% that there isn't enough money to pay a million young people who are unemployed uh, and employ them in jobs in the way that we uh, would have done in the past. So if you just take a university, university income inequalities have, have increased. If inequalities in income in universities didn't increase, so people like me were not paid more, we could hire large numbers of teaching assistants in their 20s to interact with students um, and help them with their studies. And to be honest, an 18 or 19-year-old student would rather talk about their problems to a 24, 25-year-old than to a 40-year-old man like me. We don't do that because if you don't pay your permanent staff in the universities enough, they can't afford to buy a house in your university cities. And why can't they afford to buy a house? Because other people at the top are paid so much, so it's escalated the house prices. Yeah. I mean, the other thing that often comes up is as soon as you start arguing for any equality, people think you mean total equality. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, and it's surprising how much that, that comes up. The, the best example this year was Bill Gates in Davos where Bill Gates was asked what he thought about inequality. And his instant reply to the interviewer was, what do you want, North Korea? So Bill, Bill, Gates, is, Bill Gates' honest belief is, you either have all out inequality rising, but some very rich people mm. being nice to some poor people, or you have North Korea, and there's no option in between. And he simply doesn't know about other countries, other rich countries, you know, he's not advised about them. Otherwise, you know, if, if he was, his, his pundits would have given him a better line to spout than that one. Um, <laughs> my, my personal a aspiration of, I think we should try to head to be like the Netherlands. The Netherlands is actually the middle country, the OECD, when it comes to equality. I often get criticised for why am I not more, more utopian? Why not ask mm. for what you'd really like? But when you're at the bottom of the class, we're the child, if you think of the richest 30 countries of the world as a classroom, Along with the USA, we're the dunce children, the ones who've got it wrong. You know, no matter how aspirational a teacher you might be, moving the child from the bottom of the class to the middle of the class is achievable. Moving the child from the bottom of the class to the top <laughs> really is <laughs> unlikely to occur, at least in one or two generations. Do you mean we're never going to be Finland? Oh, well, eventually. I mean, if you take, take the richest country in the world before us. Mm. Um, so we have a problem that we once owned half the world, and that does tend to make you more unequal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, partly because all that wealth coming in 
uh, gives you enough money to pay for very high inequality. It's quite hard to be very unequal unless you have a lot of money coming in. The USA now has incredible high rates of inequality, partly because it makes so much money out of the rest of the world, because it's the most powerful country in the world. The most powerful in the country in the world before England uh, was the United Provinces. It's centred around about Amsterdam. If you, if you look at the Dutch now, uh, the Dutch now are a very equal country. Uh, their children are now the tallest children in the world. Very healthy country. Uh, the country which was the most equal about 150 years ago in the world was the United States of America, where there were smallholders all over the place and they had a relatively equal wealth distribution. And the country with the tallest children in the world 150 years ago was the United States of America. Um, so things can change. Japan is a brilliant example. Japan was an incredibly unequal country in the 1920s and 1930s with an aristocracy that owned all the land. Um, now, it was losing a war and the Americans imposing land reform, imposing equality upon Japan that changed Japanese society. But w within three generations, you can have complete turnaround. Within one, barring absolute disaster, mm. um, somebody was telling me yesterday about uh, the tunnel under the Thames, and you really don't want that to pop because then London floods. What, what tunnel? Uh, the, 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 uh, <laughs> Just around, around the east, there are tunnels under the Thames, so not, not to worry you too much, but <laughs> if, you, if you go through disasters, the mm. worst disasters are wars, and after wars you get greater equality because the only people who can pay the cost of wars are the, are the rich. You have to tax the rich to pay for war. That's why our taxes went up so high. Revolutions, of course, increase equality, but they are very rare. Becoming poorer altogether, banking crisis, the second banking crisis, the, and the, the reason to mention these things is that 2008 did happen. Um, so I think it is, it is worth thinking, what would we do if there was some kind of disaster, or when there is some kind of disaster, maybe not the flooding of East London? Uh, and one thing we could do is become more equal. Uh, to give you a much more realistic example, if, if Scotland, if just 5% of Scottish voters who voted no had voted yes last week, what do you think would have happened to the pound on the international money markets this week? What do you do to defend the pound? You have to increase interest rates, 1 mm. or 2%. What happens if you increase interest rates 1 or 2% at the moment, given people's mortgages? What happens to the bank? We, bar a few tens of thousands of Scots, we could be sitting here. Well, we probably wouldn't be sitting here this week. You know, they'd be holding some other meeting because it would be much more important than this. <laughs> um, that was, that was quite close. Um, these things can happen. We still have a banking sector that is almost as irresponsible as the banking sector that got us into the crash in the first place. We're in a continent which is facing a deflationary spiral at the moment. We don't know what things going to happen, but it is unlikely that nothing is going to happen over the next 15 or 20 years. When and if it does happen, one response to coping with some kind of crisis is to say, we have a scope to do it, but we're going to have to raise money from the best off to cope with this. We can no longer cut at the bottom anymore. We can no longer cut our health service. It's already the cheapest in Europe. I mean, in, sorry, I've got to go to the floor in a second, but I do want yeah. to ask this one thing. D why didn't the 2008 crash result in greater equality? Because, it, you know, it was as bad, it was as expensive as a war. Yeah. And it, and it was at least as big as the 1929, mm. uh, 1929 crash. Um, well, they didn't pay for it through taxes. Um, you know, when, when, when Maggie was dealing with a much smaller problem, she raised half through taxes and half uh, through cuts. It, it was paid through quantitative easing, which has actually made the rich uh, richer. Mm. But the 1929 <coughs> crash didn't do, the same, didn't do this either. It was four or five years after the 1929 crash that people finally realised things were not going to get back to normal. The New Deal came in and we no longer lauded bankers as much as we had done in 1929. You don't immediately change your fundamental beliefs the day after everything goes wrong. Uh, in fact, you, you often strengthen them. Um, so we got lots of rhetoric about this crash was caused by too much government interference, and if there had been a pure free market, it wouldn't have happened. Mm. So people latch on to their, their core beliefs immediately. Um, but when we see the next problem in the banks, you know, 
how are we going to react then? And if you look at the reputation of bankers at the moment, I mean, it really is incredibly low. Um, and that is part of a sea change. You can begin to see, I think you can begin to see this, this change in what people think is acceptable. You no longer see newspapers photographing bankers paying $30,000 for a bottle of champagne. Um, that kind of thing has gone out of the window entirely. And one problem about the changing public mood is it's quite hard to monitor because you don't notice it's changed because it becomes normal not to believe or behave as you, as you believed before. Um, so I, I do think we're beginning to see an effect of, of sentiment because of that. Um, mm. But it's taking some time. Questions? I'll have you and then you and then you. Thank you. Jeremy Kaplan, Fellow of the Royal Society. Um, I, I get what you're saying about bankers, but my concern is a slightly more pessimistic one yeah. because my concern is the target of how we're responding to people getting rich quick, like, for example, footballers. Um, there is a concern that when you talk about normalization, yeah. people seem to think that saying, oh, Wayne Rooney's now getting £250,000 a week, or this player's been sold for £80 million, people don't even deal with that as real money. Yeah. But the problem is that society, like it did with banks in general, don't vote with their feet. We have an amazing inertia and people still go and pay ridiculous amounts of money they can't afford to go to games, to buy replica shirts and everything else. So I'm a little bit more pessimistic than you because I don't see how society is even voting with its feet on things that are more tangible and more immediate in terms of where the money's flowing and this ladder to get rich. Your point of view would be welcome on that, please. We'll do all the questions and then three points of view, and I'll remember them. Thank you. How's that? That's great. John Bailey, journalist. <laughs> I note in all, all that is solid, you're quoted as saying, uh, at present almost one in five people in Great Britain receives a cash allowance to help with rental crisis. Now, Did surely, say that again, sorry? you say that at present almost one in five people in Great Britain receives a cash allowance to help with rental costs. Oh, yes, housing benefit, yeah. So, isn't the next crisis likely to be a housing crisis? And isn't housing the microcosm of all what you've said today? I mean, presumably the inequalities in housing are much greater than anywhere else that can be easily perceived. Richard Dixra, uh, you mentioned Scotland uh, and of course one of the things there is that that was one of the driving issues towards why they got up to 45 per cent. That you know it was a lot of previously disengaged uh, people who decided that they did have an opportunity to change things. Hmm. And that certainly was one of the driving forces, which I think has been under-emphasized, under-reported here. And that is not going to go away, I think, in Scotland in the next five or six years. It's going to continue to be a pressure. Yeah. But then the other side of it was that it was fought against by Westminster on the basis of effectively getting the city uh, to frighten the horses by various yeah. threats of, you know, it will be a disaster, our prices will go up and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Great. Okay. On, on the footballers and, and celebrities, um, they make up about 3% of the 1%, although they're, they're the most obvious, uh, but they're only 3% of the total. You're right, there is not much anger at the moment. People are not switching off their cable subscription uh, so that they can watch sport because they realise where the money's... Uh, going to. We are very uh, docilely accepting of this. Uh, in the most unequal countries, people are most accepting of inequality. We've kind of learned to live with it. America is a stunning one where a majority of the population are against death, what they call death taxes, even though they'd never pay them, because they think their children could become uh, very rich. So, so we are very docile. We've become very docile. You see much more anger about inequality in much more equal countries, and that's partly why they are more equal. Mm. But what, what is very new is the absolute falls in standards of living. We have never had, well, since the Victorian era, we have not had four years of a, of a row of this. We have not faced the idea that the majority of our children, and this is our children, this is you lot in the room, this is, this is not the our average people, the majority of our children could be looking at being renters all their lives. Um, we are looking at the generation beneath us doing worse than, than we did. 
in a way of unfairness. Now, that normally gets people annoyed. Mm. The question is, have we become so sanguine? It, it won't. Um, housing benefit bill was absolutely enormous. Uh, this money goes straight to landlords. Landlords are just 2% of the population. Um, that's an enormous... Yeah, I'll see. Supposing I was George Osborne and they had voted yes and I was having to deal with absolute turmoil and I had to raise money and make cuts. Uh, one of the cuts I would do very, very rapidly is massive cuts to housing benefit almost immediately, tailing them right down. And at the same time, I'd enact the kind of legislation they've got in Ireland or in Greece or in most of Europe to say you can't evict your tenants. Now, what happens? Landlords at the moment in Britain do not go around fixing up the property anyway, if you go and look at it. Mm -hmm. uh, landlords have seen an increase in their wealth of 245 billion in the last four years. That's according to Savills and the Financial Times. You could cut that housing benefit bill uh, very, very quickly, but only in a crisis, politically only if you had to raise 80 billion, which is mm -hmm. the kind of had to raise last time. Mm. All thing, kind of things become possible in a crisis. The um, book I'd love to write would be a left-wing book about the cuts you could make. You know, Trident's just small. There are so many things we could stop spending money on that we currently spend money on. And I think the big debate of the future is partly about what we need to stop spending money on because we are... I'm not pessimistic about becoming poorer, slightly, because if you want world inequalities to reduce at all, you can't have Britain becoming ever richer. Um, but that's certainly one. I wouldn't say housing underlies it all. I think inequality underlies these things, uh, mm. but housing is by far the biggest, uh, the biggest effect of this. The Scottish debate really wasn't reported down here um, very well at all. I mean, it, it, it went on for years, and whenever you went up to Scotland, it's what people were talking about. To me, the most remarkable thing about the debate in Scotland, talking to people in Glasgow and Edinburgh most recently, was how many more people in Glasgow and Edinburgh they now know personally because of the debate. <laughs> um, and watching a civil society just being born and, and created of internal debate. Only 8,000 people in, in Scotland by The Guardian. It's a comp Sorry, I know. <laughs> more of them may look it up for free online. but um, <coughs> It's a separate country. It has its separate media. It has a separate uh, debate. That was the primary motive in the referendum that I saw was we do not want to carry on being the losers in a more unequal country, apart from a few bankers in Edinburgh. Mm. The secondary motive was old-fashioned patriotism, you know, want, wanting to have the flag and so on. The primary motive was not to have any more of this. They can have another, another referendum in 10 years' time. The President says, you vote 50% SNP, and if a referendum is in the manifesto, you get a referendum. Um, so it's not gone away uh, at all. And you saw this, was it this week? Mm -hmm. 20,000 people joining the SNP. Mm -hmm. uh, the SNP is changing what it is. If they ever win that referendum, the SNP goes. It splits into three parties. Scotland becomes a normal European country and has eight political parties. Mm -hmm. This is another problem of inequality. More unequal countries have fewer parties. The US have two, we have three. You know, head off <laughs> to Europe. In a normal country, you have eight parties. If you can't find a party you support, you're weird. Um, whereas, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. here, here we just have Right, I've got to take some more questions. Um, I'll take, have you, and then you, and then you. Yes. Thanks very much, Danny. Um, can you put what you're saying in the context of globalization mm. um, and the huge economic shifts from west to east that are taking place? And I think I'm right in saying the very unequal societies in places like India, China, Indonesia, and so on. Thank you. I think it might be useful if you were to show your list of possible sources of cuts to the present Labour Party leadership. They didn't do a brilliant show this week in trying to show how they would vastly improve the health service because when their figures were produced, they were belittled by the Chancellor as being a mere fraction of what the extra cross needed would amount to. 
So it'd be interesting to know what your alternatives are. I mean, in terms of housing, it would seem to me that a major uh, measure would be to go for far more social housing undertaken by the local authorities. What's to stop us doing that as a, a more sensible way of dealing with the problem? Mm. Um, you talked about the football as only being a minute proportion of the 1%. We've now got a new target, it's the oligarchs. So let's have a go at the oligarchs. Uh, that <laughs> seems to be the oligarchs. fashion. <laughs> I don't know whether you do any monitoring of where people are, and because one of the things that is said when you attempt to deal with the bankers and their bonuses, well, if they didn't get them, it'd all go off to where? Only America? Mm. Where else? Uh, do you do any charting to see where they might go? Because you've already made it clear that in Europe as a whole, yeah. they wouldn't go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. what, okay. what is the answer to that? Because, yeah. uh, I mean, there are only a limited number of oligarchs. I don't mind having a go at them. You're absolutely <laughs> right to do so. Okay. I would like you to comment on things that I've been puzzled about. When you increase people's salaries by 1% or 2% or whatever, poor people are only going to earn a very, very small amount more in actual terms, whereas the people earning many millions, perhaps three million, give them 1%. Look how much additional. Why is it that people haven't commented on this over the years, that you don't look at salaries that way, giving people percentage increases? It's crazy. In a company where you've got a vast range of different salaries, you do not give your top people the same percentage as your cleaners and your cashiers in the banks. That's one thing I've puzzled over. Second thing is the remuneration committees that are, you know, they're all kind of giving each other these huge increases where people at the top of industry and the bankers are remunerating yeah. each other. Why cannot governments say we are going to have public, the public interest um, interfering in this. We should be interfering in what those top people are doing. There should be freezes on these uh, salaries. If not, we will find, I mean, they're saying we're going to cut bonuses and so on, but that's just the, the top of the um, yeah. iceberg. Anyway, comment. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, on India and China. Uh, the richest 30 countries in the world tend to be the most equal, apart from a few exceptions like Cuba or, or Kerala in India. Uh, equality is a feature of affluence, uh, and those rich countries partly became so rich because they became more equal, so their workers actually were healthy enough to work. China is, is one of the more equal countries of the poor world. It has an inequality rate that is equal to, to the USA. The USA and China are almost identical, the USA being the most unequal large country in the rich world, uh, China is similarly unequal and becoming a little bit more unequal at the moment. India is much more unequal as, as a society. Worldwide, there are lots of different trends going on at the moment. Some countries are becoming more equal. Brazil's becoming more equal. Um, you can see a, a series of countries in which inequalities are dropping. Others are becoming more unequal. The worldwide distribution is complex. In the middle, there's growing equality. We're getting a, a world middle class of around the Chinese middle class level. This is not what you'd recognize as middle class, but there is a bulking out in the middle as you get smaller families, less poverty. But even though people are coming together in the middle, the poor are still zooming up in the world. We're not seeing a reduction in world poverty unless you're the silliest world bank and you go for $1.25 a day, uh, which really isn't a level to be proud about. And at the very top, we're getting this oligarch zooming off. Mm. Uh, you'll know the Oxfam figure of 85 families having the wealth of half of, of all of society. Uh, Forbes magazine updated it earlier this year and said it's now 67 families because the wealth of the billionaires has risen mm. so much in a short time. And then after putting it, printing it, they updated the version on their website to say it's now 66 families have the wealth of half humanity. We have an out-of-control problem at the very, very top, in a way that we did in this country back in 1913, with, who was the last who died today? The Devonshire. Devonshire. Devo. The Devo. At the, <laughs> at, the height, at the height of the power of the Devonshires, uh, when they were at their, most, at their most grandest, the world, in a way, looks a little bit like England looked 
then with the huge wealth at the top. Um, so you can go for the oligarchs, uh, but, li but list, lists of cuts, uh, the one I'd go for is one that Grant Shapps, actually, conserved when he was the housing minister for the Conservatives, came up with. Uh, Grant Shapps, as housing minister, said he wanted to see the cost of housing, house prices, uh, rise 2% less than wages every year. Um, now, if we had an aspiration that the value of our housing was in effect going to fall by 1% or 2% a year every year, it is the equivalent to a 1,000 trade unions winning all their pay bargaining negotiations because this is the bulk of your living costs. Yeah. Um, we simply need the cost of housing to begin to fall and to carry on to fall. Aim towards German levels. It's hardly an unsuccessful economy. Um, that needs to be an aspiration. It's not even an aspiration at the moment. The saving that main, makes means that trade unions don't have to be successful in pay negotiations. Their workers become better off. And it's quite hard to see who loses out. It's a childless couple who put all their money into housing and loses out. You know. But somebody's going to have to look after them in their old age, and it's going to be the state, because they're childless. Uh, so <laughs> that's that, my, my biggest one is reduce the, reduce the cost of housing. There's all kinds of things you don't have uh, to pay for when you do that. Mm. The percentage point is, is really, really good. It's amazing how much we, we don't question the way that everybody gets the same percent increase when one comes in, all the way from 1930 to 1970 across the vast bulk of British firms, people at the top got very small pay rises, people in the middle got bigger pay rises, people at the bottom got even bigger ones. This is what our parents <coughs> and our grandparents experienced as being absolutely normal. It happened in this country. There was restraint at the top because greed was seen as bad. Mm. Greed became in the 1930s, and particularly in the 1940s with the war, and in the 1950s with rationing. Greed amongst people at the top began, began to actually be seen as bad. Taking more than you needed was actually seen as bad. It's, you must have to teach us this history now. <laughs> um, but, you know, enough people are still alive from that time to be able to ask them. Mm. This turned in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, we've kind of forgotten that it's not just possible or theoretical, this was our recent history. Mm. I'm going to take one, oh, okay, I'll take two more questions and, and they have to be quick. Oh, but oh. well, they need say, sorting say out. Say it's bad. <laughs> it's bad <laughs> and, and we need people on the boards of firms who are not members of that, as, as Kate Pickett has argued for the Lay Pike Conference. Um, I'll take this question at the front and then you there and then I think it is a hard finish as they call it at two o'clock. Uh, Helen Patrick, I'm a fellow. Um, <coughs> in the light of what you just said, I've been thinking earlier, how is it that the people at the top at the moment, in the 1%, how do they think their cleaners and chauffeurs and gophers and all the rest of it actually yeah. manage on minimum wage or whatever they're paid? Yeah. Thank you. Good question. Hi. Um, I want to speak as a trade unionist. And it's significant that the growth in inequality is also matched by the time when the wealthy crushed the trade unions and prevented people acting for themselves. The things you say are good, but they're things being done for people. Mm. The way we get equality is giving people the power to do things for themselves, and in this arena, it's the trade union movement that's the body that can help people get better working conditions and better pay. Yeah. yeah. Very quick. Uh, they have little idea. Is, 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 is my, my impression because it becomes painful to get an idea because it becomes hard to live your life and to take your second skiing holiday if you generally know, you know what the person who's doing your, the garden for your garden is, is going through. So just as in the past when we had servants, they disassociate themselves from the lives because you cannot live your life if you actually know what's really going on. I agree it has to be people. Uh, but it won't just be the trade union movement. Uh, I think most of the power of this will actually come from the middle class, uh, who are a very powerful group who have lost out. In Scotland, it was the middle class who were, who were running this Yes campaign. The middle class were <coughs> angriest. They got the majority vote in Glasgow, but it was a middle, it was a middle class, ununionized section of society. You need them as well as trade unions. When this happened before, it wasn't just trade unions. It was a whole set of people, including feminists, um, who, who got us to greater equality um, before. So, and unless you have the middle class on board, 
and people in the top 10% actually realising that their future for their children is not good. You're not going to get it. If the 10% act as a solid group, as they did from 1979 all the way through to 1997, the 10% really can rule and control the country. At the moment, you have this cleavage between the 1% and the rest, and 9 out of 10 people in the top 10 for society are not doing well and are unlikely to do well, and it's in their direct personal interests for society to become more equal overall. The problem is most of them don't realise that. They think their kids can get up there. On which note, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>